Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this committee of the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome all members and welcome everyone who's watching us via the live stream this evening. Before we uh, begin the meeting uh, this evening, I would like to uh, just uh, take a moment to, since this is the uh, final council meeting before Remembrance Day, to recognize those citizens of the town of Saugeen Shores who've served in the armed forces and those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our community and for our country and acknowledge that we will remember them. And in order to make that acknowledgement, I would appreciate it if all members of council and anyone watching us would join me in one minute of silence. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is disclosures of pecuniary interest. And I'll ask any member if they have a pecuniary interest they'd like to declare at this time. Councillor Smith. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. I will be declaring a conflict of interest on agenda item 7.5.1. Uh, my husband, Ryan Smith, is part owner of the Social Athletics of Sogging Shores, uh, who facilitates the Beach Volleyball League in Port Elgin. This is the agenda item pertaining to a staff report on the Cedar Crescent Village. Okay, thank you. Are there any other uh, declarations this evening? Seeing none, of course, you can declare one anytime if you need to. We have no additions, deletions, amendments to the agenda. We do have one open forum, uh, and it's from uh, Mr. Steve Rowland, who I see has joined us. Uh, so, Steve, uh, you have three minutes, and uh, take it away. Okay, it's on the CCV development. When I opened the documents on the CCV project update, that we're gonna be reviewing tonight, I stared in disbelief in the size and scope and height of this project. Up to now, this is truly the closest image of what has been, that is being planned for our beachfront. Beach front. Now is the time for public input, not before when there were so many unknowns. I would say the majority of people in the, in the want beach revitalization, but not to this excess. I then read in the comments section of the document we're gonna be reviewing later, of the CCV report, stating that these revised documents were, from consultation with residents, stakeholders, and other people. Well, I'm a resident. I'm a local resident. I'm a resident that's embedded in the middle of this development, and I have never been given the courtesy of any consultation. I am not hard to find. I've reached out as much as possible to council and staff with tools available to me, and I'm not the only one involved in this. I find it very insulting, and there's more disinformation about the consultation process that purportedly happened. Just because you state there was consultation, that doesn't really mean it really happened. I have a list of some very specific questions and comments. The least, have all the obligations required to this point in time been met verbatim, uncompromised? Specifically, everybody's been asking this. Is the 150,000 deposit on signing the lease, was it paid or not? I don't know why it's so hard to get the answer to this. And is there a requirement for the proponents to secure some kind of insurance protection at this particular moment in time? The land is technically in some kind of purgatory situation that the town and the, and the lease owner are joint owners of it. I've already witnessed several safety issues on the site that can end up in some kind of litigation. So more insurance is better. Item number two, we are welcoming a new CEO next month. So why wouldn't it be prudent to allow her to get acclimated in her new position? Allow her time to review all outstanding agreements, specifically the CCV lease. Then come back to council with a risk assessment, cold body review, defense in depth type of approach on this project. She will have to manage and execute and maintain this project for the whole time that she's the CEO of Sogging Tours, 50 year lease. She wouldn't have to deal with David Smith's legacy. She shouldn't have to deal with David Smith's legacy, but in the end, she's still responsible for the community well being, finances, and objectives. I'm asking for no decisions on the CCV issue. They should, should not be made until council gets this review. It's a win win situation. It's a win for the CEO, it's a win for council, and it's a win for our community. 
In respect to my letter I wrote in May 20, 2020, I was asking some very difficult questions on the status of CCV as it applies to the COVID-19 environment, which I hope will be answered tonight once we get to the protective services section of the meeting. In that letter, I asked council to make a position statement on the CCV pro pro project, followed by the justification for the position, since it, a lot of the business assumptions presented by the proponent are challenged. Just stating it's for a betterment of the community is not an acceptable response. Cost of site cleanup. Taxpayers who want to know how much the town has invested so far into this project. So an update is needed here because I can guarantee the $15,000 limit has been well exceeded. Not completed yet, but a very good job. And now the okay, site- Three minutes, Mr. Roland, you can wrap it up. What, I can, uh, what can be done here. Uh, there's conflicts with the Waterfront Master Plan, the Waterfront Development, the CCD Development, and now the Transportation Master Plan is now in conflict. I'm going to skip to my closing statement. I have so, so much more, and if ever given the opportunity, I would like to share, collaborate, and contribute. And I'm sure there's other people who would like to, if given the opportunity and a venue to do so. Is this really a PPP project that the public has been sold on? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rowland. All right, that moves us then on to delegations. And we have three delegations this evening. And the first one is from Tony Alberts of the Airport Committee, and he's here to give us an update. Tony. Oh, you're still muted there, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. As chair of the Port Logan Airport Committee, I am pleased to provide the following update this evening. I'll provide a summary of the report that was provided to you in your meeting package prior to, to, to tonight's meeting. Like many aspects of our community, COVID-19 has had an impact on our airport. 2020 was a year that provided us with challenges and opportunities. Regardless, your committee and airport attendant managed to provide all who visited the airport a positive experience. As we are all aware, the airport is a seasonal operation with regular aircraft movements starting in late April and finishing in mid-November, depending on weather conditions. This year, we continue to make fuel available during the season for local and visiting aircraft. Uh, our upgraded tie-down anchors continue to add value to the facility for all those who are making Port Elgin their home base or visiting just for the evening. Again, this year, we offered seasonal, monthly, daily, and underwing options for tie-downs. There were approximately 750 aircraft movements during the season, uh, that which is an, a takeoff or landing uh, of any aircraft uh, during the days, the uh, operational hours of the airport. Although this is was a reduction from what is expected, but that is because of COVID-19. In addition to visiting aircraft, our attendant also attract visitors to the airport. Uh, these are folks who fly, walk, bike, or drive in. Due to the construction activities at the Village's Park Development, the old fairway camp, park, uh, campground, uh, our 2020 count is down. Uh, but despite that, our airport still managed to have many first-time and regular visitors, or those that maybe just had not been to the airport in quite some time. The recorded number for 2020 was 1,450 visitors. Our first arrival was, was our, our friends from Owen Sound and their Murphy Rebel in, on February the 17th of 2020. It's a regular activity for this gentleman to fly into own, uh, Port Elgin from Owen Sound with his uh, aircraft equipped the skis. Uh, due to the limited access to the terminal building, our airport register was not utilized as it had been in many in other years. But however, upon review of their daily activity log sheet, we were able to confirm that we had 135 aircraft visit sogging chores from 47 different airports across the country. Many pilots and passengers came here for the first time wishing to take advantage of the proximity to the beaches and the cool waters of Lake Huron. Visitors came for various reasons, whether it was the afternoon at the beach or a walk on the rail trail, uh, they made Port Elgin their destination of choice. Many spent time in the municipality. They stopped for fuel, had lunch, and all wanted to check out our well-manicured field. This spring, COPA, which is the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association Flight Magazine, uh, contacted me as we were listed as one of the few airports in Ontario, or in Canada for that matter, that is available for what they call underwing camping. In con I was contacted by the national office in May, and after consultation with the Director of Community Services, we were able to put guidelines in place to permit underwing camping in 2020. As noted in the COPA website, prior approval was required uh, and the numbers were limited. During the summer of 2020, we had five aircraft come for an evening. The first was a Super Cub owned by Justin Tiplady, VP of Operations of Porter Air Air Airlines operating at the Toronto Island Airport. The season was a bit of a challenge with all the required changes and protocols around COVID. Uh, this resulted in the major, uh, the majority of the work being completed by our airport attendant, Bart Mearsma, 
and the com committee volunteers. BART takes great pride and ownership for the facility and it shows with a very well-maintained property that we are all very proud of. Volunteer hours by the committee this year, four members and one council, councillor, attributed a total of 800 hours. The value of these hours equates to $21,600 based on the Conference Board of Canada estimates of the value of volunteer work. As a result of the COVID-19, all events at the airport were cancelled for 2020. And depending on the status of the, of the pandemic and restrictions going forward, we are making preliminary uh, plans for a COPA for Kids event in 2021. Uh, of course, this will be subject to change depending on the conditions that we are in come next summer. Airport projects, we, we finally completed a major project that was, has been in the works for many, many years. Uh, we continued with the upgrade around terminal and apron lighting. We installed a new weather station that was purchased at the end of last year. We put a water cooler in place inside the facility to eliminate use of single use plastic bottles. And of course we completed our aviation fuel system upgrade. The new fuel system, fuel tanks and delivery system with, with an approximate cost of $30,000 was completed in September. Final invoicing and project cost review is in progress. Uh, and we will can, and we'll be able to provide a year end financial report uh, when this is uh, completed with the uh, posting of all uh, in, 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 in invoices to the general ledger. Funding for this project will be drawn from the existing airport reserves. And when the project was initiated five years ago, uh, the committee and the staff were under, of the understanding that the unusable fuel in the existing tank, which was a 20,000 liter tank, uh, would be surplus. We are pleased to inform council, however, that we were able to transfer all of, all with the exception of 150 liters of that fuel into the new tank. The 150 liters of fuel was used by Edwards to flush the, the lines and put the new system in service. The old tank was removed without incident by Edwards Fuels. Soil samples taken and analyzed, and we were pleased with, uh, to inform you that there were no contaminants found. Evac the excavation has since been backfilled. Fencing is, is in repair at, as we speak, and the grass has already grown back over the area. At this time of the report, the financial records show that we have approximately $5,000 remaining in the 2020 grant uh, with that projected cost of staff to the end of the year. And this will leave us with a small amount that could potentially go into the airport reserves if it's not required for the final buildings on the fuel system. Uh, at this time, the Meridian account that the airport manages has $9,500 above its opening balance of 2020. And that is because we have yet to purchase any fuel. I, I can report that we did take a fuel delivery this week uh, so that uh, bill will be paid by the airport uh, Meridian account in the coming days. <clears throat> Considering the, the year that we have had and the, and the municipality has had, we at the airport committee feel that there will be not be a need to ask for an increase in our municipal grant. We do, however, have presented a budget and would request that council consider the community, the, uh, the, the grant of $24,185 be approved uh, as it had been in previous years. In, in conclusion, the airport continues to be recognized by the aviation community as one of the best grass fields in Ontario. It continues to be a valued asset of the community of Soggy and Shores and attracts both businesses and vacation travelers. As chair of the committee, I look forward to continuing the work with the committee for the overall good of the, the airport and the Soggy and Shores as a whole. If you have any questions at this time, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Tony. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Right, Councillor Grace. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, thanks very much, Tony, to you and your staff and your committee, the board for all of the work that you're doing. Um, having an airport is a really valuable amenity for our community and it wouldn't happen without you. Um, I did have, they're not really questions, but just a couple of things that I, I was interested in in your report and really happy to see. One is, um, phasing out of the use of plastic water bottles. I appreciate that. And also I was really interested to see the feature of the underwing camping campaign uh, or camping um, feature that you offer uh, that it's gonna be, I think, uh, an appealing feature, especially with people trying to uh, you know, use camping more and um, staying in Ontario. So thank you for the work that you're putting into that. and. It's great. Thanks for your report. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I saw a couple of other hands, I think. Other com comments or questions? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Councillor Carr. 
Sorry about that and got it unmuted there. I uh, just want to thank, uh, thank Tony as well. I, I'm the member that sits on the, the airport committee board with them. Uh, just getting to know this group of guys out there and uh, they do a very good job of keeping track of the budget. They're, uh, they definitely look forward in the future for where they're going to be spending their grant money. And I just want to thank them too for the work that they've done. I know I've enjoyed taking my kids out there to, to see our great airport that our community has to, to enjoy. Great, thank you. Further comments? Councillor Smith. Thank you, and, and Tony, just a congratulations to another successful year. Uh, much like many amenities that we have in Saugeen Shores, I'm, I'm not at all surprised that this is very highly ranked in the province. Uh, I was particularly intrigued and, and loved that you were able to equate uh, financial dollars to the amount of volunteer hours. I think it's, uh, it's underestimated in this community how much of our essential services uh, are done on the backs of volunteers like yourself. So thank you to you and your committee and, and as well to Bart when you were uh, rhyming off all of the um, activities that he had to complete and adapt to in, in the world that we live in in COVID. I'm sure that was, there was no small feat on his part. So thank you. Okay, further comments? I just wanna to say, Tony, I wanna to thank you personally for your leadership at the airport and particularly this year, you and I had some conversations early this year while we were trying to get the airport open and it was a difficult time. And, uh, but you, uh, you really led the airport with um, a lot of, um, very well. And, uh, and I really appreciate it, you know, the, the way we were able to work together and the way that you worked together with our staff here at the municipality and built a really strong and positive relationship with them. Uh, I think that's to the benefit of obviously the airport and the municipality. I think we're going to keep having a, a great airport in our community uh, uh, with leadership like yours. And uh, so I just want to say thanks to you. And um, if there's nothing else, then uh, thanks very much for your delegation, Tony. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. And that moves us then on to item number two. Uh, delegation, uh, which is an OPG update from Fred Kuntz and Brad Ellsworth. Actually, I think uh, we have Chris Probodiak in instead of uh, Brad Ellsworth. That's what I that's what I see here, but um, we'll turn it over, I think, to Fred to get it started. Fred. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship and councillors, for this opportunity to update council today on OPG's activities in our community. Um, I'm here, as you said, with Chris Probodiak and also observing, I believe, is Renata Dewar, they're both managers for OBG at the Bruce site, and we're all residents of Saugeen Shores. And I'm just going to uh, share my screen with our presentation so you can see it. Um, and the first slide that you see is just a nice new aerial shot that we have of the Western Waste Management Facility at the Bruce site. Um, so uh, let's just get past the agenda. It's a short one. I just have four slides. And that starts with our response to COVID-19. Um, it's been a challenging year for all of us uh, in our community in Canada and the world. We appreciate that Council is doing all it can to keep municipal services running smoothly and keep our community safe. Electricity is an essential service. OBG continues to supply half the power that keeps our homes, businesses and hospitals running in Ontario. And at the same time, we're doing what we can yeah. to help our communities in other ways we've donated more than a million masks and other health uh, care, uh, personal protection equipment. And we provided a lot of extra financial support to food banks all across Ontario, including several in Bruce County. In our own stations and facilities, we have strict protocols to keep our employees safe. Uh, rules on physical distancing and masks, we take that very seriously. And we're pleased to say that to date, uh, there have been zero cases of workplace transmission in OBG. Uh, that's, in a, that's in a workforce of more than 9,000 people. And with the second wave that's occurring, we know this is no time for complacency. OPG is also contributing to Ontario's economic strength at this difficult time by supporting made in Ontario products and services. Just recently, we announced a 1 million contract with Abraflex and Paisley for protective suits and uh, laundering services. And that's just one small example of the bigger picture of how we uh, support made in Ontario business. We know it's been a tough year as well for festivals and events in our community, uh, but that's not stopping OBG from uh, sponsoring worthwhile community initiatives. And uh, that includes everything from uh, tree plantings in, in the conservation areas to uh, support for virtual events like the reimagined Pumpkin Fest last month in Saugeen Shores. We're ensuring that all of our Bruce area sponsorship dollars are still being allocated. And now I'll turn it over to Chris to uh, describe what's occurring at the Western Waste Management Facility. Okay, thanks, Fred. So as you know, 
Uh, the Western Waste Management Facility is located at the Bruce Nuclear Site. So we receive, process and store low level and intermediate level materials from Darlington Pickering and Bruce Nuclear Stations. And we also store used fuel from Bruce A and Bruce B. Uh, we handle and process these materials in a safe and efficient manner. This is demonstrated by our achievement of operating for, credibly, we can say nine years now without a lost time accident. Uh, and since 1974, the Western site has continued to develop in stages. Under our current 10-year operating license, plans are in place for these additions to capacity. So that includes five new multi-purpose storage buildings. Three are now in the design phase with construction starting next year. Uh, there are two new buildings uh, that are being constructed to store used fuel. Uh, these are our storage buildings five and six and construction is currently underway. Uh, the concrete foundation is complete and the steel structure is actually being erected uh, today. Uh, and completion is expected next year. Uh, ongoing maintenance of the facility continues. We actually recently completed an upgrade to our incinerator, replacing a section called the bag house. Uh, the bag house filter system safeguards the environment, ensuring that any stack emissions are kept well below regulatory levels. And the incinerator itself reduces the volume of low level materials by up to 90%, which helps in the long term to reduce the need for additional new buildings. And I'll pass it back to Fred. Thanks very much. So a few words about where OPG is going after we closed our project to build a DGR at the Bruce site. We remain committed to lasting solutions for nuclear byproducts, including the lower level materials that would have gone to the OPG DGR. Uh, these are early days. We're looking at a variety of alternatives. On the slide, you'll see an example of a near surface facility in France in the upper right. That's for low level materials. There's similar facilities in the US and other countries. And the photo at lower right is a DGR in Sweden for high levels of waste that was recently approved locally and now needs a national approval. And a DGR for used fuel is under construction in Finland. So DGRs are best practice for higher levels of waste all around the world. These are just options for disposal and we'll take some time to explore these ideas before moving forward on any new project. And any new project would involve engaging with the public, with interested communities and indigenous communities. OBG supports uh, the NWMO process to build a used fuel DGR for all of Canada. And we know that NWMO is in a site selection process with candidate communities in South Bruce and Ignis. And earlier this year, Natural Resources Canada committed to undertake a review of Canada's federal policy for disposal of nuclear byproducts. OBG will look to see what emerges from that process, possibly in the coming year. And in the meantime, we're doing everything we can to reduce, reuse and recycle. Our goal is to get the volume of nuclear byproducts down to the smallest amount possible to support the best environmental practices. And finally, just a few words about OBG as a whole. This past summer, we announced a research partnership with McMaster University to research new and better ways to sort and segregate nuclear byproducts. You can see a photo of the uh, laboratory in Hamilton. We hope that leads to innovations and ways to support our processing, diversion and recycling efforts, including at the Bruce site. We also recently launched a new center of excellence in Pickering called the Center for Canadian Nuclear Sustainability. And that research hub will focus on decommissioning nuclear plants at the end of their life cycle. And as you know, Pickering is scheduled to close in the mid 2020s. And the future of clean energy lies in part in small modular reactors. All around the world, companies are racing to develop these smaller uh, reactors to help provide zero carbon energy uh, to fight climate change. OPG is an important player in the search for these solutions. We have multiple multiple partnerships with other companies to try and find the winning technology to be licensed in Canada. I mentioned Darlington Refurbishment. That project is uh, on time and on budget. We recently completed work on Unit 2. It's back in service, and we're starting on Unit 3 now, which is currently being defueled. Uh, that's a major achievement given the uh, pandemic. And we're also a key supplier to Bruce Power's uh, MCR project of refurbishment. Uh, we'll be managing and processing the used reactor components from that and sharing lessons learned from both our refurbishments. Uh, so that's our update and we welcome any questions. Thank you, Fred and Chris. All right, are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Oh, uh, Councilor Mayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Fred, thanks very much for the presentation. It's always a pleasure to see OPG represented here at Saugie Insurance Council. Um, I just wanted to say that I I'm uh, very optimistic about your about your chances of getting approval for a DGR in South Bruce Peninsula. Uh, we all know that the South Bruce Peninsula mayor and council are our forward thinking bunch. 
and they're intelligent and they're able to decipher fact from fiction. And I believe that their residents are of the same mindset. And I'm very optimistic that you will receive, uh, receive welcoming news and welcoming uh, re a good reception from them when it comes to this, what is really a great opportunity for that municipality to participate in the nuclear industry. So just good luck and thanks again for coming out and, uh, and uh, filling us in on what's going on in OPG. Just to be clear, that, that's the municipality of South Bruce, not South Bruce Peninsula. Are, are there uh, further uh, questions or uh, comments for Brad or Chris? I don't see any, so I'll just say uh, for myself, thank you very much for coming in. Always eager to hear more about the small modular reactor work uh, that OPG is doing. I really do think that that's critical work for fighting climate change. And, uh, and I'm glad to hear that our uh, own Ontario uh, energy producer uh, in OPG is doing work on that. I think that's critical work and I congratulate you and thank you for it. So with that, uh, thank you for your delegation and have a good evening. Thank you, good night. So that moves us then on to our final delegation, which is from Shiraz Mustafa and Malcolm McCallum of West Aerial Power. And they're here to uh, talk to us about the West Aerial Power capital forecast. Well, sure. uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for giving us the opportunity to provide you with an update on Westerio's capital programs, uh, especially how they are specific to Saugeen Shores. And we'd also like to advise you how important it is to our customers in Southampton that we continue in 2021 the investments in the electricity distribution system that we initiated in 2020. Uh, Westerio's engineering manager, Shiraz Mustafa, is, is with us and he will expand upon our planning process and the future projects planned for uh, uh, Soggy Shores. Shiraz? Yeah. Good evening. Uh, thanks for uh, having us here. Um, I'm not sure if you guys seen these presentation slides there. Uh, it's coming right now. Okay. Yeah, again, uh, but I, I would like to first start to, with the uh, background behind the forecast plan that Bristol has put together for Saigon Shores and for its entire system. So as you may know, as per the Ontario uh, Energy Board, the regulation uh, and rules that Bristol Power has completed an asset condition assessment of its distribution network. So basically the core of this, uh, the core objective of this study is to generate the health indexes of its current uh, uh, condition data that is in service and its network assets. And also for this paper is basically to recommend a, replace, a replacement plan for, if, for the next five years. So the plan was completed back in 2018. Um, uh, the uh, asset uh, condition assessment basically assesses multiple categories of uh, of the asset that compromise the standard distribution system. The adoption of the ACA method is basically requires a uh, an inspection program, a testing and and recording of its condition to identify those most at the risk. So for uh, computing the health index of the, of the of its distribution asset, it requires identifying the end of life criteria for various components uh, with each asset type. The criteria represents a factor that, that is an, uh, an inf influential in, in, in determining the components of, of current condition to, to the condition that is re reflected to the potential Failure. So the component tests uh, are ranked and the tested results uh, are weighted based on the significance in, in determining the given assets end of life. So Vestero's asset, uh, asset management plan uh, places an uh, emphasis on the safety, reliability, and, and integrity of its electrical distribution uh, network. Some, some of the uh, asset classes include uh, the distribution poles, overhead primary conductors, uh, distribution transformers, substation power, and distribution switches. The result of the, of the study indicates the following priorities is relevant to these siding shows. So the 
forecast plan for 2020, as you may have been notified, is that we have replaced approximately 65 to 70 decapital poles uh, between Victoria City and McNabb City in, in Southampton. We also completed our substation MS2 in South, Southampton as well for 2020. Uh, 2021 plan is also to approach uh, and complete uh, approximately 80, 80 more decapital poles between Bruce County Roads uh, 13 and Victoria Street and uh, Greenville Street as well. In addition to that, we also have plans to rebuild MS3 uh, substation. I will come back to that point actually to kind of, as we like to stress more on that uh, MS3 substation as uh, we start inquires an uh, additional um, uh, an expansion to its existing property of, of, of the station, which we which we require to in, to enable us to uh, um, for our newly designed substation for MS3. Uh, 2021, we also have plans to actually uh, replace the uh, overhead system on the Ottawa Ave to, an, uh, to convert it to an uh, underground system. In addition to that, we also plan to have to uh, replace further big decapital poles um, as part of our, uh, our asset, uh, ma asset uh, plan. Uh, 2023 uh, is also in a phase two of the Ottawa Ave rebuild and uh, also an additional uh, decapital pole replacement for the future. And thank you. And uh, if and I believe Malcolm want to add some more uh, information regarding to MS3 substation rebuild in 2021. It's actually, it's, for, it's a continuation, I think, um, so, you know, it, it's a project that we definitely need to move forward with. Um, you know, we have been given guidance uh, from Linda indicating that the process might take approximately six months to get approval to expand uh, our property required to, to uh, construct MS3. I think it's important that we understand that we need to move forward with this. It's a very critical program. It, you know, as Chiraz mentioned, we uh, did the study in 2018. Uh, these programs uh, were very critical, as you can tell, because they're only two to three years subsequent to the, the study being conducted. And as you are likely aware, there were some issues when we were working on MS2 last year with the distribution system and recognized that this uh, construction on MS3 was very critical so that we could continue to serve, you know, as a business partner with, with Saugeen Shores to continue to provide the services that we need uh, to, the, to our customers. So, um, you know, I guess that's the reason for the uh, presentation is really to clarify, you know, what our plans are going forward and why we need to expand the property that on MS3. Hey, well, thanks very much, uh, Malcolm and Shiraz. Uh, are there questions or comments from members of the committee? We do have a report on this coming up. Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Malcolm and uh, Shiraz. Um, I was um, happy to see that the Ottawa Avenue uh, rebuild is going to be converting from overhead to underground. Um, do you know if this is something, a trend that you're going to be trying to uh, follow in other uh, situations around town? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, wherever we have the ability and the flexibility to, to convert any overhead to an underground, uh, we would do that. And so for now, we know the Ottawa, it's a critical uh, location of subdivision where we have most of our rail lot, our backyard poles are really bad and decrepit. So uh, it's, it's, it's our priority to convert that. And, and, and we are doing it across the territory where uh, we have the, uh, uh, when we have an opportunity to do that, we would do so. Okay, are there further questions or comments? I don't see any, so thanks very much, uh, Malcolm and Shiraz, and we're going to deal with this uh, this matter up next here. Thank you.
So that moves us then on to uh, item seven, reports of municipal officers and 7.2, which is a staff report on transfer of land to West Ontario Power and the clerk. And thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you to Malcolm and Shiraz as well. So as we've just heard, West Ontario Power has plans to replace and expand their substation located at Bruce Road 13. And in order to accommodate the expansion, West Ontario would like to acquire a small uh, parcel of land from the municipality. The land that they would like to acquire is part of our Oak Birch Park, and that's located at 229 uh, Turner Street. The report before you outlines the history of the property of 229 Turner Street, and also the location and size of the subject property to be transferred to West Ontario. West Ontario is asking the municipality to consider selling the land for a nominal fee, a dollar. Um, and I also need to update this report because I am pleased to report that uh, the financial impact uh, can be upda updated to reflect that West Ontario representatives have confirmed that they will pay for the survey and the municipal legal fees. So in effect, the municipality should have no out-of-pocket expenses. Um, Malcolm had mentioned that um, I had suggested a, a six-month uh, process be to get the final approval. And I wanna assure you that a good portion of that timeline is to get the survey completed. So the sooner that they can start um, retaining a surveyor and getting the survey work done, will uh, expedite the process. Uh, so in summary, with uh, council support, staff will commence the surplus land process, which will include a public notice process. And we will report back to, uh, with a bylaw once the process has been completed. Thank you, there's a recommendation. I'll read it, we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that council authorize staff to undertake the necessary process to facilitate the transfer of a small parcel of land located at 229 Turner Street to West Ontario Power Incorporated. Is there questions or comments from members of the committee? The Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank uh, Malcolm and Shiraz again for the presentation this evening. And just a win-win for the town of Saugeen Shores and uh, that parcel of land. It's, uh, you know, investing in our infrastructure here is, is, a, is a good thing for for our municipality. So I just wanted to, to thank you both for the great work you do. And um, I'll certainly be uh, supporting this recommendation this evening. Okay, thank you. Further comments or questions? Don't see any. So you've heard the uh, recommendation, all in favor? That is carried. Thank you. All right, that moves us on to uh, 7.5 protective services and a staff report on the Cedar Crescent Village and a presentation by Pierre Danini. Uh, so we'll begin by turning it over to the uh, Director of Protective Services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's a staff report uh, in front of Council tonight and it'll be followed by a presentation by Grant Demert, architect and Pierre Danini, proponent of the Cedar Crescent Village. The original designs for the Cedar Crescent Village received in 2019 have been refined based on consultation with residents, stakeholders, and community groups. The proponents have been working to develop a design that achieves the goals of the project and include a variety of recreational experiences and food services. The attached uh, images and layouts are not technical in nature. They serve to provide council with a sense of the proposed use and layout of the leased lands. This step of the approval process is, is a requirement of land lease and serves as a check-in by the proponent to ensure the project is supported before investing in further design costs. Council is being asked to approve the proposed design with regard for the overall size, quality, and character of the project. Final technical designs, including construction plans and site servicing agreement, will be further developed based on the designs as presented tonight. Council will have an opportunity to approve more specific details of the design as part of the site works and servicing agreement. And, and with that, I'd uh, ask Pierre and uh, Grant to, to present the images, layout and site plan as, as they've uh, provided us with, and then answer any questions council may have. All right, thanks Phil. I am not uh, the most technically proficient, so I expect all of you to scream at me if I'm not doing this right. Um, a little bit, of, I wanted to start with the, I've been asked two questions a lot in the last seven months. Uh, one, uh, the number one question is, are you guys okay? As in me and my business, my family, my employees. It's been really great for the community to always be checking in. But the number two question has always been, um, where are you on the Cedar Crescent Village, which is a normal question. So I'm going to go, I'm going to start by actually 
recounting a little bit of a history lesson, recent history lesson, so everybody understands um, the timeline and why it took the time it took, which I think is mostly understandable. Um, March 16th, 17th, I, I can't remember exactly the day we were shut down. I believe it was the 17th. Um, my, my business, our, our restaurant, um, um, faced uh, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I had to lay off all of our staff uh, a day later, uh, something I never thought I'd have to do. And um, it was uh, a really hard one. And um, as it turns out, uh, the community came through um, for all of us, uh, all of our families, and um, we got through it. Um, and for that, I'm grateful. And, and I know all of our, our extended family at the, at the Queens are also grateful. Um, but it uh, backburnered a lot of things we had to prioritize. Uh, and I'm not alone in that. Um, my partners at the Cedar Crescent Village had their own worries and their own concerns and their own fears for the future. And, um, and they also had to prioritize. And, um, and I think that's understandable. So I'm going to call that a six to eight week uh, uh, delay. It didn't stop us from thinking about it. It didn't stop us from talking about it, but it did, uh, it did delay something. Uh, as well, uh, the, the, the vital professional services we require to, to come up with the design and site plans and et cetera, uh, all, the whole world was delayed. So, 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 so there we are. Um, you know, the other question I've, I've been asked a lot is, is has, what, what has COVID done to change um, this project? Um, and, and, and my answer is this, I think the community agreed that this was uh, a vital uh, infrastructure uh, project that the public uh, entity, uh, sorry, a private entity was gonna provide with, in partnership with the, pub, with, a, with the public entity as in the town of Soggy Shores. We, we, we agreed on that a long time ago. Um, but I think what COVID has done is made it actually even more important. Um, uh, it's infrastructure, in an industry, hospitality, largely speaking, that has been quite hard hit, even, even in our community that is um, very lucky to, to be in the position we are. Um, I think uh, what I like to call local tourism, defined as two to 300 kilometers from your home, is gonna be in very high demand uh, for the foreseeable future as people seek uh, uh, places to go and um, with, with, with a way less, um, with a lower risk, perceived risk. And, and, and driving from wherever in Southwestern Ontario to enjoy sogging shores and, and more amenities is only gonna be more important. Um, so I, I think COVID has focused about, focused us as how important this is. Um, you know, our society will figure out COVID in the end. Um, I believe in science and I believe in our ability to do those things. Uh, the future has not been canceled. Um, so we have to move forward and, and, the way, and we are moving forward. So, so, so that's kind of answered the question that a lot of people have been asking me. Um, um, I'm just looking here. Um, we set out a lot of goals uh, publicly through the entire lease pro process, um, had multiple hearings. Um, ample public um, input um, nonstop to this day. Um, and, um, and we're very confident that, that when we looked back and we said, we have a stated set of goals, a stated uh, use for this land, and let's design around those needs. And it should be actually a fairly simple thing to do. Uh, we didn't have to really reinvent the wheel. Uh, everybody knows what we want to do down there. Everybody agreed. Most people agreed with it. And, and so um, revitalizing the parking lot down there for the whole community, I don't want to say it was easy. It was easy to think about because we knew already what we were going to do. Um, um, we're creating a, sp a space to play, uh, eat, gather, and explore. Um, um, and, and, and for young families, the thousands of young families that have joined our community, uh, their parents and their uncles and aunts, this is gonna become a focal point for a lot of their activities. Um, 
uh, not to mention things like sport tourism. Um, I think it's going to be, those are all fairly obvious things. So I'm going to talk about the design. So let me, we faced several challenges. Um, and, 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 and simply put, the three biggest challenges were uh, a lot of feedback we got was make it coastal. And uh, as we learned, uh, there's an awful lot of coasts in the world and, and everybody has their own idea as to which coast they like the most. And um, so getting down to a design that made sense was a challenge. And I think we've succeeded. Grant has helped us a lot and has succeeded in that. Um, what materials to use to build was another challenge. Um, again, they have to be appropriate and we had to give it a lot of thought. In the end, I think um, a finish that is gonna appear mostly uh, wood and natural materials like that is gonna be the winner, so to speak. Um, uh, bricks are, they have no place on our waterfront. Um, flat uh, industrial metal, concrete, things of that nature don't have places on our waterfront. Um, those are easy things to figure out, but, but still we had to think about them. The, the last challenge we had in the design before I start going through some images was one I did not expect. And, um, and I actually don't remember who brought it up first, but, but we had a, 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 a sort of informal aesthetics advisory group that we convened a couple times. And, and I recall it coming from there is that there is no back to this development. It, it's all front. Um, there is no uh, places you can tuck um, sort of the, the, the workings of, 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 of restaurants or, or shops or, or, or store chairs or volleyball courts, the, the volleyball nets, things of that nature. There is no back to it. So that presented a design challenge because every angle of the, of the design of the, of the complex is up front, so to speak. So, um, I'll speak to that when we start looking at some pictures and, and how Grant came to some pretty good solutions about it. Um, I'm just going to. Share my screen. All right. If there's any issues, please let me know. Uh, all right. Um, we are using a local designer. Um, uh, local is our first choice of everything we're doing. Um, our group of, uh, of uh, our board of uh, Cedar Crescent Village are all locals. We all have businesses in Port Elgin. And, um, and our designer, Anne-Marie McDowell, has done some great work for us. Um, she has advised me and my crazy ideas and toned them down and, and has come up with some really great stuff. Um, so play, eat, gather, and explore or what we are all going to be doing down there. And um, obviously there's some leeway in all those definitions, but um, I think, I think they really hit the, 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 they, they really hit what we need to create down there. Um, she's picked some really great colors too, which I think we can probably um, piggyback on when we're starting to talk about um, what's this thing going to, what's the color of the thing going to be. So I'll go to my first image. Okay. So that is, the view uh, with Harbor Street to your back facing west. Um, our original uh, images that we released of this uh, tended to be a more uniform, um, longish looking. Um, I, I Grant is here. I don't want to insult him. <laughs> it had a had a blockiness to it, let's say, and um, and 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 we got a lot of feedback from the public that that was not good enough. Um, so we went back to the drawing board several times, um, um, and and came back with this ultimately, which I, I'm pretty satisfied of with, and uh, and the and the responses on social media in the last three four days have been really overwhelming. What, what that creates is what you're looking at is that what I like to call, and, 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 and I don't know if Grant likes that term or not, but it's got the village feel. The buildings are broken up so that they don't look like a, a, a monolithic one big piece of, of, of construction. Um, that, that, make, that softens the look. 
um, makes it um, much more pleasant to the eye and, and allows for all sorts of natural materials to be used to build it. Um, Oh, I also want to um, uh, caution, maybe that's the wrong word. The ultimate colors, um, you know, that's board and batten, what they call board and batten on that, on, that, uh, on that structure there, which directly to the left, which is the market building. Um, all things that in my view, uh, there we view them as ideal in the way we presented them, but, but certainly uh, we're open to discussions with regards to the, the, the minutia, the details of whether that should be painted blue or peach color or sand or 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 violet or whatever. So, I what we're interested right now is is in the concept. Um, okay, that is the view of the uh, restaurant. You are looking north, uh, so south is to your back. Um, this took an awful lot of work to get to this, and I'm really pleased with it. Um, uh, again. We, we, we struggled with what is coastal a lot. And, and there are some great examples um, and we kind of uh, made a hybrid of that. Um, um, what you're looking at is uh, uh, the market building again on the very right to the immediate left is, is uh, um, uh, a raised terrace, if you will, which will have seating outside for the restaurant. There's an outdoor kitchen out there and an outdoor bar. Below it is all open air, available for vendor stalls, uh, gatherings, uh, seating for events inside or outside the, 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 um, the Cedar Crescent Village. There's a lot of flexibility. Flex is a is a is a term we're gonna you're gonna hear a lot because I think it's important nowadays to create space that's very flexible. The restaurant is L shaped. Uh, the terrace you see on the on that second floor uh, is all belongs to the does belongs all to the restaurant. And then further on there, you see is public uh, raised viewing area, which there's more of around the corner. Um, so that view uh, is facing east, roughly east, up Mill Street. Um, this is my favorite view of the inside of the, uh, uh, of the development. Um, I, I, I want to stress that the inside of the development is still very, very much a work in progress with regards to ultimately how it will look. Uh, there are some things that Grant and I are still not quite satisfied with, um, but, um, but we feel we're on the right path. And we'll talk about those when we get further down. Um, as you see, what we're doing is creating spaces where people can do things and, uh, and, and the free flow of people in and out and around and through is, is, is really vital to creating this town square down at the waterfront, which is effectively what we're trying to do. And, 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 and it's very vital. Um, large windows, garage doors, um, lots of light, uh, lots of natural light um, all the way through. This is another view of the. Oh, it's another view of the inside facing south. So, um, in the foreground there is the pad that we have labeled skating pad. Is that correct, Grant? Yeah. yeah. Um, it it happens to be full of sand right there, I think, um, and 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 it's being used as an exercise area. Uh, again, it's extremely flexible space. I'll speak to volleyball in, in a bit. Um, uh, and that is looking directly south. As you can see, the stalls, the, the open air deck we created next to the restaurant is meant to uh, have a free flow of view and, and, and people walking back and forth. On market days, there'll be vendors down there. Um, and in the winter, we'll put blocks up, uh, wind blocks to, to, to make it more conducive to, to do activities inside. I, I, I'm going to go to great pains and I, I, I'm remiss, I should have started with reminding everybody that this is a 12 month a year project. It is not an eight week uh, a year project. Everything we are doing down here is with a mind to remember that it has to be um, sustainable and um, sustainable and, and, and uh, able to uh, financially matter 12 months a year. 
obviously January, February is not going to be like July, but um, but it's uh, it's it's just as important. Um, viability is a is a sort of a catchphrase, but I think you understand what I mean. Okay, that's another view of the inside facing a little more westerly direction rather than south. The bridge, as we're sort of uh, calling it right now, uh, and that's another thing. All the names are temporary. We haven't finalized a lot of them. Um, it connects the restaurant to the event hall. Uh, it's a great space. Uh, we'll look at it on the plans. It's open. It's It's got wonderful views. Um, it, it connects people. Um, but um, I want to see it a little less glassy, um, if possible, if that's even a term, and 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 make it a little warmer. Uh, Grant is aware of that. Uh, this is already a warmer version than the originals we've had, and 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 we are working on it. In the foreground, where those three people are standing, is is an event stage that will be there most of the time. Although I think it will be also removable, and um, and we anticipate it'll be a center for the arts in our community in, in many ways. Uh, this is a view uh, approximately due north. Um, that stage I mentioned is there in the back, in the very back. Um, I don't have too many other highlights there. This is a view uh, directly uh, west. Uh, you can see through to the harbor um, and, and, and up the stairs to the public viewing area, which will be accessible to everybody all the time. Um, all right, so a couple things I want to touch on. Um, the, this has been an extremely public um, process from the beginning. Um, we have heard from many people and, and some many, many, many times. Um, and, and, and a lot of that went into what, what we designed. Um, the original, uh, Dan Morosky's original concept had a fairly substantial tower. Um, we got mixed feedback on that through the piece. Um, we decided to remove it um, based on, the, on most of that feedback. Um, uh, we created, uh, you can't see, you can see my cursor, can't you? Um, we've created this ribbon here, which is labeled as driveway, very specifically called a driveway because it is not intended to be a full-time through fair, but it is um, in response to several uh, uh, pieces of feedback from the community. Uh, one was to ensure that it was uh, there was accessible um, accessibility to all people all the time, um, and and that was really important. And and I'm talking um, elderly uh, handicap accessibility, um, all sorts of all sorts of those kinds of issues had to be addressed. Um, as well, it was important that our our, uh, our friend and neighbor Joan at the Harbor Light had plenty of uh, uh, her her restaurant wasn't forgotten in all this. In fact, it's going to be one of the highlights, in my opinion, on the waterfront. And and so we had to make sure that there was lots of uh, ways for people to get to her restaurant. And, and this driveway is one of the solutions, as well as parking that we have created there. Um, Another issue uh, that we responded to uh, a lot of feedback, we had a overwhelming support from boaters, but they were concerned that for years they've been able to use um, parking quite close to their boats and, and, and wondered what solution we had. Again, the driveway um, uh, provided that solution because we, we are able to create um, what I hope will be some managed temporary spots so that all the boaters and visiting boaters will have the ability to load unload as needed um, and not be too inconvenienced. I go to great pains to call this a driveway and not a road because we would like to be able to control the flow on this, meaning um, when there is an event at the, at, the event, at the event hall, which is on the second floor where I'm uh, waving my cursor, um, maybe a wedding party wants to drive a limousine there and unload and take photographs of the family. Um, maybe when there is a retirement there, um, there's a ceremony, somebody wants to drive there. Um, we need to provide access for them. Uh, the other issue, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, is there's no back to this complex. And so deliveries of, you can name it, how many deliveries we're going to have to uh, accept. Uh, we, we, we had to make 
place that met, made sense based on where the kitchens and the back works of the, of the restaurant and the event hall were placed. This made the most sense. Grant can speak to that further if there are questions. Um, um, the restaurant. skip ahead and then come back which is basically this and this is smaller than originally designed which was a response to uh, to um, uh, feedback from the community um, I'm gonna skip jump back and forth what we are calling the kids activity area which is right here uh, that structure had a, a very high peaked roof um, deemed Barn like by some, um, and uh, and we were we were pretty convinced after we heard everybody's comment that that was probably not going to work. So that is gone and and is now going to be a flat roof. We believe we're going to be able to create some pretty interesting kids activities in that space, and the flat roof is actually going to make it easier. So uh, stay tuned for some some fun exciting things there. Um, the event hall. Uh, is smaller than originally conceived, and that was also a response to um, to um, to commentary. Uh, where I'm moving the cursor now is uh, we've temporarily named it the Sunset Terrace, which will be the public viewing platform that replaces the original large structure of the tower that was envisioned at the very very initial. As well, there is this uh, what Grant has called the Sunset Pier, which is not a bad name. Uh, which will extend slightly below the restaurant, if I'm not mistaken, and 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 continue all the way down, which will provide a really great viewing, strolling, uh, connecting um, area for 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 people. Um, I wonder if it's best to take some questions right now, um, or should maybe should we give Grant an opportunity to speak to some of the issues or some of the things his thoughts behind behind some of the design? What are your thoughts? Grant, does Grant, uh, if Grant has comments he wants to make, he should make them now. And uh, I'm sure that would help council if he does have additional things he'd like to say. Actually, before Grant starts, I want to actually address one other issue. Um, so our original concept had uh, uh, up to three or four volleyball courts in the center. Um, when you start getting down to the nuts and bolts of designing things like this, you start thinking about how those things will work in the real world. And um, we decided that that many courts was going to make the footprint bigger than we and the community wanted it to be, um, but also was going to limit the, the, the welcoming use of the center. Um, and let me give you an example. Uh, the, the, the league play, league play is one thing because we know when it is, um, it's managed, um, it, it's a different thing. But let's say it's Saturday morning, um, one in the afternoon, everybody's enjoying a beautiful July day and the sand is in, the nets are up and just whoever comes by and starts hitting a ball around, that we were concerned that that was going to make it uh, less conducive for the myriad of other activities you'd want to do in the middle there. So... Um, Early on with staff, we did talk about the possibility at, at our expense of uh, because relocating uh, volleyball courts has always been our goal to help the community increase its towel space, uh, which is a concern among a lot of people. Um, we believe there's still a lot of uh, unused, underutilized space, um, I, I guess it's south of here, that we will be able to relocate um, including the two pads we have in the middle, another four to, for a total of six. Right, right. And, um, and, and we believe that will uh, accommodate most of league play uh, and, and also achieve uh, the goal of letting the middle of the courtyard be more available to grandparents taking a kid for a walk for an ice cream, and not worrying about balls flying all over the place. And, uh, and I think that's a really important consideration. But that said, we are committed to volleyball. And, and, and that's why with, with consultation with staff, we think we have located enough space 
uh, obviously it'll be at our expense. We're not expecting the town to pay for that, but we think we'll have lots of uh, opportunities to, to, to create the six courts we originally uh, envisioned. Grant, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You're, you're on. Yeah, we can't really hear Grant. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, to <coughs> speak a little bit about materials, I'll start from the ground surfaces. And what we had in mind there was a mixture of boardwalk and interlocking pavers or cobblestone appearance. Um, when we talk about the walls, uh, such as Pierre showing in the image now, we're speaking of board and batten, which are classic uh, residential products. So they are pre-finished wood or they can be a cement fiber panel. Uh, but in any case, what we're illustrating for the sake of the discussion tonight is uh, gray and white, which are classic beach theme colors. Um, we've tried to expose structure here and there throughout the project, including what you can see underneath the overhanging roofs where the cars pull up. And we've used the white color on the garage doors that we're proposing at this point, and they um, have glass in them. So we're hoping for a high level of transparency and daylight inside of the space. Uh, again, recognizing that during the winter, we want the spaces to be friendly, warm, and um, inviting. And especially at the, in the evening hours, this will be very important. Um, re regarding uh, the use of garage doors, I must say that it's a notion, and they are currently present in the City of Own Sound's revised market stall situation. They seem to be functioning pretty well, and our, our idea here is to use them in much the same way. But we do intersperse them with regular doors and windows and side lights that you can see in the drawing. And that's simply because we could replace, for various reasons, a garage door with regular um, glass and uh, doors instead. So it's not necessarily that you would see garage doors in every location here. It might be too many, uh, in fact. Um, we do believe that it should be possible during summer months to open parts of the building completely to allow the uh, pedestrian traffic to flow immediately from the parking lot directly through the project, through the buildings and into the uh, courtyard. Um, so, Pierre, could you show the south view of the restaurant? So, on there it is. Uh, on, on this slide, Pierre mentioned the volleyball courts. And what I was trying to say here was that this court we're showing is actually the one that we had uh, proposed on site plans a long time ago. Um, and we've left it here in the image to demonstrate that the courts ought to fit between a planned sidewalk, some. Planting to control sand erosion and lost you. Oh, he did. I think we've got you back now. Hello. Okay. Yep. So what, what we're trying to indicate in the drawing is that the volleyball courts remain in this location and that the uh, plans that were initiated quite some time ago as very preliminary, I imagine, um, remain to be developed with the town staff. Um, but but that we're aware that there are uh, sand and wind erosion controls uh, uh, to consider that there's grading and drainage, that the elevations of the, of the development are yet to come, and therefore we're not um, fully uh, technically ready to talk about the volleyball course here, but the plan is that they would fit in this strip between the development, parking, and the beach itself. So on uh, this particular view, we see uh, gray, um, supports supporting the, the project. So our intent is to clad those with the pre-finished wood look materials. And then in the background, the building, which is the restaurant, 
is currently in the image it's shown covered in a wood shape look material. So again, these could be pre-finished wood or pre-finished cement fiber panels commonly used in residential construction. So the color scheme at the moment is white and gray, white trims, um, uh, certain metallic accents. Of course, we have uh, a lot of signage and other things to consider, all of which require uh, part of the site plan approval uh, process, and we're anxious to get uh, move forward on that. I don't know if anyone would have any questions about the materials at this point. Um, Pierre, if you could move down one image in the list. And just by way of example, in this image, the, the cedar shakes are showing and the color there is a slightly off white. So that would be what, what to, to through the window on the left side of the image is actually what we call the ship store. Um, and it may or may not include things like tourism or rental facilities for beach equipment, such as stand up paddle boards and the like. And then as you look through the development toward uh, the market buildings in the background, they have the, the gray colored uh, board and batten with the white trim. So that is the beach theme that's in the imagery. And you can see that people are walking on a boardwalk material. So in every case, um, we, we've illustrated sand in what we call the uh, skating pad. And the concept is that um, because volleyball might require netting and other things that impede full use of the place, you would not use um, necessarily the sand at all times. We're showing it there because uh, the group is perfectly willing to move it in and out as required. And of course, in the event of a large volleyball tournament, I would imagine that both of these courts would be operating. However, if, if one were using the courtyard here as this command central for let's say a triathlon or a running race or um, any, let's say a cycle race through the community, you, you would definitely want more open space. So the plan we've got here is to contrive a means to make this uh, skating pad many things. So at times hard surface, at times sand, at times a volleyball court. And in, in every instance, we would make the development barrier free. And so the access from Harbor Street would be barrier free via the Mill Street divide between the buildings. And the access from the west or the harbor side would be barrier free through a drop off. And in fact, taxi cabs, um, people can deliver their uh, family members who may require assistance to that uh, drop off in the, in the driveway, as Pierre said. And then at the south end of the project, which is the um, view from looking due north uh, here on the second or third, or second from the bottom there, one above the, image the, the, the rendering, sorry. Oh, the rendering, sorry. Yeah, uh, okay. that one. Yeah. So, so in fact, just to the right of this image, we're, we're standing in front of a planter um, but to the right of it, this boardwalk would actually turn into a ramped surface, a uh, hard surface leading down to the sidewalks that have, again, lead to parking and the beach itself. So we're barrier free all the way around the project. Um, and I will point out also that pedestrians using the uh, North Shore Park path would enter the courtyard from the Elgin Street location or either of the center uh, east and west access points, or they can come right around the whole project and enter from the south. So this, those of, um, pedestrian access points would be available at all times, day and night, including the staircase up to the uh, sunset viewing terrace in the center of the west elevation. Let's do that. The sunset viewing terrace. So, this is what we're doing. so regarding the Pierre touched on a couple of points regarding the what we call a bridge, 
Um, and what we're anxious to achieve in the glass that you see in this image is a great deal of transparency to invite um, curiosity among other things uh, from the people using the courtyard as to what might be going on on the floor above and to display the courtyard to those people using um, the walkway between elevators and the event hall. Um, so we think it's going to be a really interesting uh, point of engagement in the project and what we have to come to uh, a balance about is the divide between residential scale products and windows and materials to larger, more commercial uh, things, which we find so desirable when we're on the inside. So I would say to you that uh, the bridge as a glazed piece is very compelling for those who are using it, uh, walking between elevators and the event hall or between the restaurant and the event hall. Uh, so it's going to have a lot of animation provided to the courtyard itself. Uh, especially on days, uh, for example, when there would be a wedding or some other celebration going on in the event hall. So that, that is the reason for the glass that we see, but we're working on ways to adjust the scale of that. So Pierre, on the site plan, At this point, the project's concept hasn't changed at all since it was first presented to Council, and it's really not changed too much since Dan Morosky and Pierre worked on it together prior to my involvement. Um, but the key piece here is we're trying to join the community to the water through the project. And we're so fortunate in the location that we have here in as much as you, you can actually see walking down Mill Street the divide that's created between the buildings that cuts right through the courtyard and provides a, a distant view of the harbor in the background. And vice versa, when you come through the harbor, I believe people will be attracted to the inside of the project. Uh, and in this way, at, and at all times of the day, people will be able to, to walk through the project and experience it as a part of, and an extension of the city or the town rather where it meets the water. Uh, and this, after all, I believe is what the intent of the waterfront master plan was, was to provide some attraction at the water that would contribute to the life of the waterfront and extend the, the vacationers experience of, of Port Elgin itself that much further. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, are there any questions? All right, well, thanks uh, for the presentation, guys. I'm just gonna, yeah, that's good, thanks. I gotta see everybody here, but yeah, so no, I appreciate uh, the presentation. I guess just to sort of um, reiterate here, uh, what we're doing this evening is uh, reviewing these um, proposed uh, designs and the intention then is uh, with council support that the proponent would take these away and do the more technical detailed uh, work that needs to be done. What we have before us is a, a floor plan, but not, not really a formal site plan. There's a lot more work to be done to get to that point and, and also buildable drawings and all those things that have to be done. But this really is a check-in with council on uh, you know the things like the orientation, the, the layout, the scale, um, the use of the facility, all those things, um, so that they have confidence when they to go and spend the money that will be required to uh, be spent. Uh, and it's a considerable expense to get these detailed and buildable development drawings done. We will then see down the road. So, so I guess we're interested in council's comments uh, on uh, those components and uh, and. Um, I know Council's uh, keen and just as keen and Pierre spoke at the beginning about wanting to see this move forward. Obviously this has taken a lot longer than any of us would have liked uh, because of unavoidable circumstances. And it's good to see stuff starting to happen again, good to see it moving forward. And we wanna find a way to make sure that we can keep it moving forward. And, uh, um, and so hopefully we can provide some good comments here tonight and, uh, and um, you know, come up with a good path moving forward. So um, 
with that preamble, are there any questions or comments uh, from members of the committee? Vice Deputy Mayor. I'll start then, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, um, I, I have 10 or 15 items, but I think I'll just present three or four maybe, and then I'll turn it, turn it back to council and we'll steal all the questions, that's for sure. So, uh, but if, if I circle back later in the meeting, if they're not covered, I wouldn't mind coming back to a few of them. Thanks for your presentation, Pierre and, uh, and uh, Grant. I remember back uh, years ago, Grant, we worked on the Port Elgin Library together and uh, we tied the old old Carnegie Library in with the new and did, did it quite effectively. And uh, I think people are very happy with, with uh, the library today. Um, I just was, uh, Grant, you talked about, you know, the waterfront development uh, and extension of the downtown and, um, the uh, Port Elgin facade program guidelines uh, were developed back in 2011. And then in 2015, the Explorer the Bruce uh, um, toolkit, uh, they, they were adopted by council as well. Um, I'm just wondering if Grant and, and Pierre, if, if the 2011 facade guidelines for the Port Elgin downtown, uh, you, you mentioned that is an extension of the downtown or should be connected. Um, did you take those two reports into consideration when you were designing this development? Yes, uh, uh, we, uh, we did take uh, those into consideration. We did not feel that we should not, at this point, uh, cover the project in signage and lighting. Oh, you I feel that we should you froze. at this point What's going on? No, you're good now. <laughs> no, you're good now. We've, we've got a lot to do with a lot of work to do with lighting and signage. And those two components and those two are, components are you, uh, an you important too. part of the discussion. 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 I'm with beer live okay. and speaking, it becomes- um, Sorry about all this. Uh, nope. There's a lot to cover there, Mike, and, and we would deal with it, I hope, through the site plan application process. I, I, I wanted to grant it, we'd be through the site, site plan control. And uh, so I'd be anxious to see when it gets to site plan that those are, are covered off from that 2011-15 report. Because I think, you know, we invested in those two two reports, and and I think uh, you know I, I can remember back when Dr. Roger Brooks was from destination development was in town. I think Cheryl was at the same workshop I was at, but he, you know, he 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 talked about creating creating destination and consistency, and and uh, create a look and a feel, and you know, and I think that you know from a tourism standpoint, a community standpoint, um, he you know he mentioned some very good. You know, that, that whole image, gathering spots, con, you know, continuity amongst the community and so on and so forth, and tying the downtown with the waterfront. And I did make reference to the waterfront comment, Grant, and I'm glad you picked up on that, that there needed to be that connection. Um, if I could, I know this is about design, but can, can we talk about some peripheral items too, Mr. Mayor? Like I, I do have questions about the Saugie Valley Conservation Authority, for example. I know we're talking about design today, but it's an important question. I've done some research on it, and I think it's important for the public. I've, I've been reached out to a number of people constantly ask about SPCA, and I think we need to clear it up tonight. Um, and, and can we do that? I know we're talking about design here, but I think it's an important question that I want to ask. We can briefly, but I we uh, just so long as we don't get off on too many. No, it's, it's not really a difficult. I, you know, the uh, SPCA and, and Grant and, and Pierre are aware of this, but the SPCA did, did assist uh, you know, the developers with the terms of reference for a coastal engineering study. And I guess my my question is that happened in the spring and then late summer and, and they're not received that coastal engineering study yet. And I'm just wondering if that is forthcoming. You're on mute. You're on mute, Pierre. How about that? Um, uh, we have done a study. We have conducted a study. We were aware of uh, the staff's concerns. Um, we have been trying to do more than one thing at once, to be frank. And and the design, uh, putting the design before council and, and completing the coastal engineering report where there are two fi uh, 
uh, focuses. They coincidentally happened virtually at the same time and concluded at the same time. So we're here tonight to talk about this. Once I've got this uh, uh, dealt with, uh, we I don't be... want to dwell on that, Pierre. I, I didn't want to dwell on it tonight. I just I know they're they're looking for a receipt of that. I talked yeah. to and and a so. study has been done, and okay. we are ready to talk to them uh, about details. Great. And just a comment about that. I, I just asked about the, you know, the hundred year flood line that was changed in 2019. You, you know that, mm -hmm. and uh, but not recently. Well, 2019, I guess, is recent enough. And uh, so I know they're interested in the coastal study, and um, you know, and to determine the the impact of the development on how's hazard line mapping. So I, I yep. that's and dynamic beach and so on and so forth. That's good, that's underway. Um, I had some questions I, and I just wanted to spell some of these things if, if you could. We're not building the train station building. I, I had an email saying, why are we building a train station building? Obviously we're not, correct? That's correct. The developer's building that. Yes. Um, I had comment about we're taking up the train tracks and re-graveling the train tracks for this development. We're not paying for the train track. Development, correct? The town is not paying for that. No, it's not in the agreement. No. And and a question to Phil Eagleson. Phil, are we sending that out to tender? Probably the train tracks. I guess that that'd be for later and later in the plan, correct? Yeah, we're going to work with the proponent to see what kind of train uh, uses okay. that space, and then it'll be RFP probably. Great, thank you, Phil. And as far as you know, people talk about the hundred fifty thousand dollars payment. The, the, all the lease, all the lease uh, requirements have been met, correct? Payment has been made and received. We have a receipt, um, yeah. so everything is in order. Okay, and, and, and thank you for indulging me in these because I get, you know, we get asked discounts. No, I understand. Discounts, lots, of, lots of questions, and I just want to have them answered tonight in public. Um, I, I had a, a question about, you answered my question with the volleyball courts. I saw that they had been reduced. Um, if you could just answer me this, the square footage of the development um, dating back to January when we saw the last drawings, uh, how much do you think the development has been reduced from a square footage standpoint? You mentioned a couple of areas where it's been reduced. Can you give me a, can you give us a number in terms of it's gone from 30,000 square feet to 25,000 square what the number is? What's it, what percentage has the, the development been reduced by? The, the lease, uh, as agreed on, uh, uh, I'll permitted 33,000 feet of footprint, Mike. Uh, our, our lease payment is based on that. Um, we, we, what you saw today is a, at approximately 30,000 feet. So it's a 10% reduction. 10% 10, 10 reduction. Thanks for that. Um, the, the, the parking, you know, from, from the original plan, yep. is, there, is there more parking, less parking, or about the same? So we are responsible for the one, roughly 1 1.8 acres that the lease encomp encompasses. Within that, there is more parking than we originally uh, envisioned. Uh, there's more parking on the Elgin Street side. There's more parking because of the driveway I referenced. There's more parking, uh, temporary loading and unloading um, um, uh, for for disabled, all that stuff is there's much more of that than the original drawing, and and I think the driveway is a big reason because of that. Outside of the 1.8 acres, that's 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 the town's responsibility yeah. and, and within their. Uh... Pierre, I really like and Grant. I uh, spoke fairly vocal about this about the handicap accessibility, and I like the way you built in the roadway, the drop-off areas, the little roundabout turnaround for the Harbor Light restaurant. I like those features. I think you've done a really good job with, with accessibility when there's drop-off points. And, I, and, I, and I'm pleased that you've addressed that. I think that, that you've done a really good job on that. So from what I see in a way, it's hard, hard on the uh, laptop, you know, to, to really get a good feel for what this development is. We'll, we'll send you printed copies. That might yeah, really, help you. It really <laughs> looks like, but... Um, just one or two, Mr. Mann, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over. But um, oh, actually, I will leave it there and let other council members ask. Council members ask. Thank okay. you very much. Yep, thank you. Uh, further comments, questions from members? Council Grace. Oh, you're still muted there, Cheryl. There thank you, you Mayor, and thank you, Pierre and Grant for your presentation. Um, a number of my questions have been asked and answered. Um, 
But I do have a, a couple more. Um, you mentioned that the um, that the event space is going to be smaller than originally intended. Um, how do you have a sense of what the capacity would be now? Um, it, it it depends on what kind of capacity we're talking about. Is 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 one of the answers. I'm not trying to dodge the question. It de it's dependent on the type of event. Um, round tables, as an example, versus rectangular tables take up more space. Um, so um, our goal is uh, a round tabled event. I mean, Grant is staring at me because he's way smarter about this stuff than I am. But we're, we project that with round tables seating about approximately eight people, uh, we're going to be able to fit 250 people. Um, uh, and, and that. Could you, could you just repeat that number, Pierre, because you broke up when you said the number? Uh, okay. Can you hear me okay right now? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, counting round tables, which do take up more space, uh, we, are, we are projecting this hall will hold up to 250 people. Okay. Um, and uh, I know that the original design had talked about 300. Yes. Uh, was that based on a round table design? Yes, yes it was. Okay. Um, it, from the timeline uh, that you presented, uh, the projected timeline, it looks like there will be, um, which to me, I don't, I'm not familiar with all the technical construction terms, but it looks like there will be some construction that will be taking place during July and August. Yes. Um, what measures will be taken to mitigate the disruptive effects of this on beachgoers and residents? What kind of construction will it be, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, I'll, I'll let uh, Grant speak to the kind of construction, if you can reference the, the point on the timeline. I will speak, generally speaking, we have trying to avoid at all costs more than one summer season of, of tie-up with any sort of construction. So it will be completed with only one partial disruption of a summer and and that's it it's in everybody's interests um, we don't want anything more than that um, um, the, the 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 nature of the design will allow phased construction some parts will be faster than others um, so we anticipate portions of it will be more will be usable faster than other portions um, um, specifically the structures uh, that are on the east side are likely going to be completed faster than the structures on the water side. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't, you know, uh, do two things at once. And, and, and I think we're entirely capable of that. Grant, can you give uh, Councillor Grace any further information on that? So um, we think the uh, likelihood is that the site will be fully fenced. There is some interface required with the town. And on our schedule, we try to display a willingness to keep the construction off of the adjacent roadways, including Harbor Street and Elgin Street, as much as possible. But inevitably, we're going to have to bring the vehicles for the construction work onto the property. So there's some negotiation required uh, between the town and, and ourselves about where that would occur and how it would look. But my hope was when we developed the schedule and it was done in consultation with uh, the construction manager who's Alan Hastings Limited. Our hope is that we can get the digging in the roadways over with before July and August and get the services onto the property uh, and out of the way of the public access to the beach as quickly as possible. However, during construction season, that is all of July and August, there will have to be work underway on the site. Um, we'll, we'll be fencing the, the site uh, to keep it secure as possible. We'll be restricting access. And of course, the contractor will have supervisors and flag persons at all times. Thank you. Um... I um, had a question about the, um, I don't know exactly what the technical architectural name for it, but for the market area, 
with the um, the peaked. Uh, I'm not. I'm. They're not really turrets, but you know what I mean. There are some higher um, structures on the top of the roof. Uh, is there a utilitarian purpose to those? Is it a design, coastal design um, kind of feature that? I'm just thinking about people who are living across, who are concerned about height, and um, just wondering if that could be um, changed without sacrificing a coastal look. We were trying to develop a, an architectural language that includes dormers. Um, we also had in mind the idea of widow's watch and we wanted to screen the mechanical equipment from view on the roof. So those of you who know the Sogging Golf Club, for example, there's a fence construction on the roof of that building. And we propose to emulate that idea. And so what, what we're trying to do is admit daylight to the building, but also subdivide the roof into smaller parts um, to, to make it visually more attractive. The windows that you see there are are about three feet high or a meter. Um, they're not large windows. And so they will allow daylight into the space. They'll animate and enliven the rooms uh, considerably, I feel. And they also serve to subdivide the roof line. Uh, it seemed like the idea of a continuous roof was not nearly so attractive as, as this one could be. And then on top of that, we've contrived it means to create um, flat areas at the very peak and conceal equipment uh, on those flat areas um, so that we're not enlarging or, or displaying the air conditioning units. That's not the intent. So that's what you see in those drawings. Thank you. Um, we have a shortage of indoor gymnasium space in our community. Um, and uh, I'm wondering that flexible space that's pictured on the drawings, if that's something that would have the potential to provide that kind of gym space, is it big enough to do pickleball, for instance, which I have a lot of folks asking me about. Um, um, there's gonna be a lot of space for that kind of activity. Oh, Pierre, you're muted there. Too much technology for an old guy. Um, there's a lot of space for that kind of activity, Cheryl, uh, including in the event hall itself. Remember, we committed to providing that space um, subject to booking and schedules um, um, throughout the year to various community groups, and, and we're still committed to it. In fact, we're researching uh, the cost to us of, of what it would be like to, to design the floor in the event hall to, to be able to sustain uh, dancing, um, a bunch of kids running around playing dodgeball or that kind of stuff. So that is absolutely in the plans. And I think there'll be two locations within the complex that will be able to house that kind of activity. Okay, I have one last question. It's really a comment, I guess. Um, uh, I was glad to hear that you're still going to be considering softening some features. I mean, I know um, uh, we all have different aesthetic preferences. Uh, mine probably tends to be more traditional, um, coastal with uh, more nautical features. And, um, and I, like um, the Vice Deputy Mayor, would like to see perhaps uh, a consideration of some of the Port Elgin toolkit um, colors, maybe a softer blue, uh, blue gray, perhaps. Um, and I'm just wondering, the restaurant, the south view, the color looks very monochromatic. Is, is that something that's maybe hopefully gonna be changed a little? It will change, yes. Uh, Something like that is extremely negotiable, and and we're and again we 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 wanted to create a, 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 a an impression right now. Uh, the details, like what you suggested, are are very much up up to talk and negotiation, and and we will we will we will uh, we will probably be changing that. Okay. Councilor Schreier. 
Uh, thank you. And through you, um, thank you very much, Grant and Pierre, uh, for another great presentation. Um, so just to clarify is that we're, we're reviewing these conceptual designs. Um, this is a very important step in order for you guys to get to your next step, which is doing the construction drawings, which will um, articulate all of the uh, measurements and sizes and uh, elevations that people are curious about. Um, so I appreciate that. And I think that in the staff report, it was worded very well is that this is a check-in essentially. Um, this is this is where we get to get our eyes on the conceptual designs and then move forward to the next phase. Um, Mike and Cheryl both talked a little bit just about the lease space. So the building space, which is about 30,000 square feet. Can we just go back to um, the actual parcel of the land itself? So I think that, and I went through some of the older notes when, when we had last um, seen you guys uh, present. So the RFP, I think, outlined about, give or take, 95,000 square feet. Um, and I think your proposed development, including the interior space, was at about 75,000 square feet. Are we still pretty much on par with that, give or take? I'll let uh, Grant talk about that. Yes, we are. Perfect, thank you very much. And just the height then, and, and Cheryl had mentioned those dormers as well. Um, is that, I think at the time, the, the tallest point of the building was 10 meters. Are we in and around there again? Yep, we are at 10 meters, yes. Perfect. Um, I also, I think a lot of my questions have been asked and answered as well, but I think that, you know, I have to, commend you guys, um, our partners on uh, continuing on with this project. I think that we as a town, um, we need to continue to support our existing and our new businesses before, during and after COVID because we will get through this and and uh, and this will be a, a successful business like our other ones. Um, I think I, I've always supported the project. I will continue to support um, you guys and, and your team. I think that you're doing a, a fantastic job and, and I'm looking forward to breaking the ground. Um, I also want to remind everybody as well is that, you know, with the breakwater uh, project that we just finished up and, and we thought, holy, you know, when is that going to end in the, the lay down area of that construction? And look what we we're left with. It's awesome. It's beautiful. And it, and it was an inconvenience for a little while, but we got there. And I think that uh, the Gantt chart that you guys have provided for the construction, um, your planning, you know when our busy times are on the beach, is that we will get through this construction as well and we'll be left with something uh, beautiful and gorgeous. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rich. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, great presentation, guys. I, uh, I love the design. Um, I think that anyone that uh, knows me, um, especially you can ask my wife, I have no aesthetic um, value to add to any project at all of any construction. Um, our home um, has been designed by her and I have no input. So when I look at that, I think it looks great. I hear a lot of pe other people adding um, um, feedback. I think anything that I could add would not be as good as uh, an architect or a designer could bring forward. I love the fact that you've um, taken uh, public uh, uh, comments and consideration and changed the design in order to uh, um, meet their meet their needs. I think that what you're doing is a great thing. I think it's going to be great for the beach. And it's going to be great for this town. And uh, thank you for doing it. Okay, thank you. Uh, further comments? Councillor Carr. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, same thing, a lot of my questions have been answered already and asked by my colleagues so far. Um, I guess first, and I have lots of questions here, I guess still, but uh, first, I guess, Pierre, when you say there was a reduction in site by about 10%, where was the actual reduction? And where was the size change that you went down to percent then? Was it in the restaurant sizing? Was it in the size of the courtyard that shrunk down? Is it because you've moved those volleyball courts out of the center and moved them off? And I guess as I follow that question, the volleyball courts, if they're being moved out of the center courtyard, are they off their RFP, like the, the initial proposed lands and they're getting closer to the beach and the pavilion from what I see in the pictures? So the volleyball courts were never in the calculation of the 33,000. So we found reductions in, uh, in square footage in the restaurant, in the event hall, um, and, and in somewhat in the marketplaces, all responding to um, of public feedback. Um, the volleyball courts, as I explained, we're still committed to a total of six in very close proximity. Uh, we just wanna make them work 
for everybody, including people that aren't playing volleyball. So, um, and this would be at our, our expense. This is not, we're not proposing uh, new expenses for the town. Um, um, if, if as, as Grant mentioned in the fore, foreground of, of the picture of the, of the rendering from the south, there is volleyball activity there. We believe we can fit up to four more, very close to it. We will pay for it. Uh, in consultation with staff on where they believe the best locations are, uh, with always the goal being uh, increase and preserve towel space on the beach. Sorry, so just to be clear then, the way I understand that then is that the volleyball courts would be off of the RFP lands then, is what you're saying there? Uh, it depends. Some yes, some not. Yes. Okay. Um, I guess the other thing uh, I definitely like in the drawings there that I've seen that, that you've added that roadway between, uh, you know, the front of your restaurant yep. and the Harbor, which is definitely a good thing. I know I, I was definitely want to see something like that to allow that through traffic and some of the yep. elderly to come through. Uh, is that, uh, on your dime or on ours? That is on ours. Okay. And then as, also as is the cul-de-sac, uh, to the North of the development, which makes access to the Harbor light, and the rest of the harbor very accessible that is also going to be our expense okay that that was going to be a question so thank oh sorry you. i didn't mean that yeah no 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 that's good thank you that's answer right. as you can um and then the other thing i noticed on the drawings there too is that you do have that parking labeled as asphalt that i am under the assumption that's the town responsibility that would be our deal and i thought when we had originally talked that was going to be some sort of permanent surface or something other than paving over the sand do you have any comments on that phil I think we, we can still deal with that in the site plan agreement, uh, whatever council, whatever hard surfacing council would like. And we'll have to uh, seek approval, not in only in this, the final site plan, but in the development of the drainage plan as well. But that area, just to clarify the council's question, that area is under our control. Like the parking area to the east is, munis is the municipality's responsibility and, and whatever happens there will be council's decision, correct? That is correct, yes. Sorry, Matt, carry on. No, no, that's good. That that's just to be clear that that's that's over and above that that's on the taxpayers is, is what they're showing in their drawings is stuff that they're expecting the taxpayers to do. Um I guess and and not really a question directed to, towards Pierre and, and his group, but definitely thank you very much for the work. I mean, it's definitely improved in my opinion too from what we've originally seen. Um, but just to follow up maybe with Phil and Jane, I know myself have sent a few emails asking a, a few questions that I have not had responses on yet as in the total uh, dollar value of the cleanup of the beach. Um, and as well as uh, Pierre did uh, allude to the fact that the deposit was received and I just did, sent an email to requesting a timeline as to when that was received. So I'm hoping that maybe either Phil or Jane can uh, give us an idea when we're gonna see a report and if we can maybe sometime put a date on this so we can expect some numbers back in a timeline. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I don't know, I can leave it to them to answer, I think, uh, we can ask staff to report on those items, uh, perhaps when we come back, when they come back next, or I don't know what they, if they have any comments to give us now, Phil, Jane? Yeah, the the, um, the cleanup and the restoration of the site, the removal of the train station, Council's aware was not a capital approved project um, in the year, and we absorbed most of the costs out of operating. Um, we were able to accommodate the cleanup when crews weren't as busy as they would have in, in other years. And we absorbed most of the costs during the operation. So we have to break out the costs um, from our regular operating budget, day-to-day -day operations. And, and we will summarize that for council's information. Okay. All right, so we'll get a report on those items then uh, when, we, when, we, when this uh, circles back to us. Is that uh, fair, to, fair enough to say, Phil? Yep. Okay. All right. That's okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Are there further uh, questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. The vice deputy mayor. Oops. Sorry, you're muted there, Mike. Sorry about that. Again. Uh... You know, you get lots of calls and emails, members of the public. And, you know, I just wanted to let people know in the community that, you know, Phil Eagleson uh, is is overseeing this project because, you know, he is he is the uh, the director of protective services and he 
Uh, he's got a long, long community emergency management coordinator. Phil's got lots of titles, but he, he also oversees the building department. And so just so the members of the community are aware, why is there fire chief uh, overseeing this project? It, it, it's for good reason. And for those listening this evening, um, and Phil was, Phil was, Phil, Phil's job's changed a lot over the last uh, couple of years and has taken on new responsibilities. And one of the responsibilities in addition to building is, is overseeing the development of the waterfront. So I, I think, you know, I just want to mention that Mr. Mayor tonight because I've been several people asked why, why is there fire team involved? So, but yeah. just in closing, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, we have a great team effort going on here in the municipal office at the moment without, with, since the departure of the CAO and waiting for a new CAO, uh, many members of staff are taking on some additional projects and uh, and doing a great job of them, including uh, Phil. Yeah. So just in closing, I, Mr. Mayor, I just want to say I, you know, there's been a lot. I, I, I think there's been a whole lot of changes put in into the, these plans since the inception, and uh, I, I like I like many of the changes. I think there's still room for for the design, the softening grant. I, I think that you know whether the the colors the. the you know the softness windows. I, I think I think there's still some room personally, but um, you know it, it's behold of the eye, right? Everybody looks at things differently. I'm I, I'm getting old too, and and young people in the community, I, I suppose, maybe would look at it and say, this is this is absolutely perfect. You know, so I always have to take that into account. You know, I'm I'm maybe looking through a little bit of a different lens sometimes. You know, so but I know uh, there have been some good change from accessibility standpoint. You cut down square footage a little bit. Um, you know, I, so I, I, I like a lot of the changes and I think there's still, still some room. And you mentioned right at the beginning, Mr. Mayor, that, or someone mentioned that, you know, there, there's site plan control and we'll have an opportunity to take another look at this and, and, um, there, there'll be, uh, there'll be, there'll be room for further input from the community, I'm sure. So anyways, that's, I just wanted to add that thing. Thank you. Yeah. So there is a recommendation. Uh, and I will read it. I would just say uh, for myself, uh, I certainly appreciate all the questions. All Virtually all the questions I had have been answered either through the presentation or through the questions of my colleagues. So uh, I appreciate that. And I think the key thing is, the key takeaway here is that, uh, um, you know, an approval here of the recommendation will give uh, these gentlemen the ability to do that work, come up with that um, work for a site servicing agreement, come up with uh, the, the work they need to do for buildable drawings. Uh, with all the measurements and all the technical details and servicing corridors and all those things that we need to figure out. Um, but that there will be more, and it's how we've already heard this evening from Grant and Pierre that some of the aesthetic elements are still uh, under discussion and still um, subject to change. Uh, and, uh, and based on the input they've heard from you folks here tonight, and I'm sure they're hearing from members of the community. So, um, so that's still, coming along and there's gonna be some other opportunities for us to talk about those. So um, I just wanted to clarify where we're at and where, where we're going. Matt, Councillor Carr, sorry. Sorry about that. Just one question there too that, that, that I missed. Um, I was just curious, reading Phil's report there on uh, one of the estimated dates for the January, 2021, the staff and council report, uh, it says the review of the site servicing and construction drawings by staff. Is it gonna be staff and council or staff? Yeah, so so with any development, staff reviews it first um, for for the compliance with the building code, compliance with many many other legislations, and then uh, staff makes a recommendation to council for their final approval. So staff and council will have a review of this then ultimately. Correct. Thank you. Yep, and then uh, and and as things progress, uh, those as I was saying, those aesthetic elements will become more fixed, and we'll have more opportunity to see them completed as well. But uh, um, anyway, I'll read the recommendation and uh, we can go from there. It's recommended that council approve in principle the attached designs for the Cedar Crescent Village and the preliminary development schedule of the project. Is there any further? Seeing nothing, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Pierre. Have a good evening. All right. That then moves us on to communications and petitions for committee of the whole information. There are seven items there. Or is, does anyone have any comments they want to make to any of those? I don't see in oh, the vice deputy mayor.
I just want to make, am I in the right section? Um, uh, Bruce, Bruce Road um, 25 Storm Outlet Committee Minutes. Is that where we're at? Yep. Right now? Okay. Yep. Okay, I have, a few, I have a, few, a few comments. Just bear with me here and I'll pull them out. Amanda's on the line, I see. So I know the committee's <clears throat> at <some> meetings and <clears throat> I, 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 I've been a little confused. <laughs> A little confused with, 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 with the overall design of points and times where, uh, and then I've been reeled back in with speaking to a couple. Well, to the chair of the committee, Matt Carr has been great to talk to, and I talked to Council on this morning, and they, you know, clarified some things, and then some some additional information came out later in the day that confused me again about about the uh, plunge pool. Really, Amanda, I see you're here, so I just wondering, Amanda, and I know I've talked about this in the past, and. The mayor's mentioned it too that you know we like to see a gold standard development down there. I think the residents in that area expect you no know, less, and I hope the end design is something that we can be very proud of aesthetically with grasses and and I you know that's not just your standard uh, end of pipe um, flow from up above in the tablelands and 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 creating some contours through the sand and and it looks like looks like. Um, Looks like uh, it doesn't look so good. Yeah, I, I storm storm uh, outlets across their uh, waterfront. Um, some of them leave a little bit to uh, left to be desired. I they don't look so great. But this one here, I think we have an opportunity to do something really special. So I hope I hope uh, that's where we're heading with this. But Amanda, just wondering with the uh, on your just at the bottom of the <clears throat> report, the sketch of the diagrams, engineering drawing, or they call it that. But, can you just clarify for me uh, the plunge pool. Is is there going to be standing water? I, I think I'm I think I'm clear, but I want to hear from you again. Um, when the rocks are, or the boulder is going to be removed from the existing installation that could be what, what the county just finished up, uh, will those rocks be removed? Are we going to create a, a plunge pool with a three four feet of water that becomes a, a hazard, a danger for young children playing, so on and so forth? Though, what's it going to look like? Or, or is it something that is going to be a lot less, like like shallower for six six inches a foot? Um, what explain to me how that plunge pool works at the end of pipe, Amanda, and how much standing water that there's going to be at the bottom of the of the pipe? Okay, so um, the plunge pool is like a basin. So imagine your bathtub with the pipe coming out where the faucet comes out to fill the tub, being right at the top of the tub. So the water will come out of the pipe and drop into your bathtub. But now that bathtub is a meter deep and it is full of rocks that are between 0.3 of a meter and 0.5 of a meter deep. So you'll have one or two layers of rocks filling your bathtub. As the water comes out of the pipe, it'll hit those rocks. The energy will be lessened, so it won't be coming out as forceful. That area is five meters by, or six meters by six meters in this sketch, and that will have water in it. The bottom will be sand though. So when the lake water is low, the water will be able to infiltrate out the bottom of that um, basin. Then as you move towards the, the back end of the bathtub or the basin, there'll be a low spot there that allows the water to flow out. That would be the same elevation as your tap coming into the bathtub. Does like that so, clarify? No, that helps a lot. No, that, I mean, the, break it down in simple terms for me like that sometimes helps because I, I don't quite get some of this, these things uh, on occasion. But um, so the contour, like the, where the water is flowing right now, Amanda, um, is, is that going to be the, the course that we'll be looking at basically when we put in our dune grasses and armor stone and is it is it approximately where it is flowing now? Has it taken its natural course? I think you wanted last year, you said, oh, let's, let's leave it a year and let's see where the natural flow ends up. Is that kind of where it's going to go now then, where, what we're looking at today? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, that's exactly the intention, that the plunge pool will outlet in the same location you see the water going now. What I have to say with that is that the water will decide where to go past that point. So as the sand gets pushed up, you'll see the water down the beach moving north and south along that beach as to where that I is see. easier for it to go. In an email today, Amanda, you suggested council could receive the recommendation, I, and, uh, but I think the recommendation is to approve. 
but you also mentioned that staff can incorporate a revision to the plan such that the outlet for the plunge pool is at or below the elevation of the storm pipe to minimize the amount of storm water. So is that something that, that's not a hard change, Amanda? Do you Mr. No, that's not a hard change. What it means is that you'd only have that one meter deep plunge pool at the bottom of the, the pipe instead of having a one and a half meter uh, potential for water ponding at that, that location. It's easy to incorporate into the height of the armor stone that goes around the plunge pool. Okay, understood. And, and just so one last question, Mr. Mayor, good. So the, the natural course the water is taking, um, I think in one of the plans, Amanda, you're, you're back a little while ago, there was, there was talk about heading more northerly before and then turn west. So that's not happening, obviously. It's going to just, it's going to go where the natural course is taking it right now. So maybe this is for you to Matt, perhaps, the chair of the committee, Matt. Um, the John Cowles Parquet, um, you know, there, there's going to be a little fundraising campaign happen for that. And we're, we hope to do some good things down there in memory of John Kyle's. And uh, so in the, in the not too distant future, the community will be asked to make contribution to that project, Matt. Be, because where the, where the, where the, uh, um, the, the contour of the water flow will be flowing, is that theoretically going to maybe perhaps create a little more space for the John Kyle's Parkette? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, as we had kind of talked there earlier, our first recommendation to council after seeing how the water had kind of made its way down to the, the beach road our summer this year, uh, we had had an on site meeting as a committee just to kind of reevaluate before we brought a recommendation to council. Uh, upon us going down to the beach and seeing what we were seeing so far, um, mainly, you know, this is where it, it, it's over and above my head, too. I'm not an engineer with it. Um, but from where the end of pipe is, um, if I'm using the, the correct terminology, Amanda, where the invert of the pipe is, our uh, stones will be coming up to that. Currently, right now, we're about halfway up, so that's going to be brought back down. And we were happy with the way the water was making its, down, making its way down to the beach, the way it had cut itself through. Um, our main worry there was the infrastructure at the bottom of the hill where the hydro pole is and the guard wire that we have to protect. Um, so yes, our initial plan that we were going to recommend was going to have about a 30 meter, if I'm not mistaken, Amanda, uh, for lack of a better term, retention pond, not a retention pond, but, uh, that way we were hoping that if there was going to be any kind of benefit to water quality that was going to be entering the lake, um, which we were sure there wouldn't be enough of a gain in the water quality at that point, because there isn't enough fall between uh, where the end of pipe actually is. And once again, if I'm using the right terminology to where the dynamic beach line is, where we're actually allowed to put infrastructure in the ground. Um, so yes, to, to answer your question in the long way around about there, um, it was beyond what the mandate of the committee was set out to do, but it, there was definitely talk that if we're not gonna go up that 30 meters that maybe, you know, when we do the beautification of that area that we can extend maybe that parkette down that way, which would allow walking access around uh, the end of pipe so that people aren't having to cross the water at the beach. You know, eventually I'm sure water levels will go back down and at that time, but that's also in the recommendation where we've asked to, you know, keep the committee together so that we can reevaluate because yeah. uh, we are not seeing the, the full flow of this pipe yet. It's not totally hooked up. And, and I've definitely heard that loud and clear uh, through this whole process that, that we don't know exactly yet. Uh, so far, we're happy with what we're seeing once we tidy it up, um, but we, we want options left on the table there too, that if we do see an issue or constant blowouts or some of these other worries that were definitely expressed that, that we are going to manage them and, and have a plan to go Okay. Back. Well, thank, thank you. And Mr. Mayor, just some add, just some add, that's great news about the park at size could be, you know, theoretically could be enlarged a bit. And I think that's, I mean, I think the whole intent there for the John Cowles Park head is to do something real special. And if we enlarge that a little bit, I think that would be uh, tremendous. His budget's budget involved, obviously. But my last question, to Mr. Mayor Amanda, Amanda, if we put a number yet on the uh, dollars that are going to be required for the end of pipe design, from the end of pipe down to the waterfront, uh, is there? Are you budgeting for that in for 2021? When would that when will that work be completed? So through you, Mr. Mayor, in the 2020 budget, we had five thousand dollars earmarked for the design of down at that end. That will be through a landscape architect to do that work. And when that design comes back, uh, then we could put a price to do the construction for that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the recommendation was approved by council before we started that design. Sure. So it hasn't been started yet. 
but with it, it, it will be a 2021 uh, project though. We're thinking. I don't. I mean, if it's approved by council, the the budget, the dollar amount, but is is the plan to, to actually do the work in 2021? Three, Mister, I don't have that as a plan yet um, because of waiting to see where the recommendation fell. But uh, one of the things we talked about in the committee meetings was looking at the TD uh, funding opportunities for these sorts of en endeavors. So. If this just, is uh, okayed by council tight, then that's where we'll start looking to find I, funding I, I, and for it. Thanks. I just know the 100th anniversary of the uh, Robinson Beach Association is in 2022. And I know they like to have a, a pretty special uh, day for the Don Carlos Parquet uh, opening. And uh, they're hoping that the actual work on the end of pipe to the waterfront will be done as well. So I'm just wanted to throw that in. But thanks, Amanda and Matt, for your explanations. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, this is a subject that we're going to be talking about on regular council as well. So, uh, so there's other comments about this. We can certainly have them then as well. Um, are there anything else on the communications or petitions? I don't see anything. So that brings us to the end of the committee of the whole agenda. And we can have uh, announcements by members and the deputy mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, just a reminder to everybody that Wednesday is Remembrance Day. And Remembrance Day this year, because of COVID, is going to look a lot different. Our local legions will be live streaming the event. So if you have a moment, please take that time at 11 a.m. to take a small moment to remember the sacrifices of those uh, who gave the ultimate sacrifice. And please try and help out our local legions. Okay, thank you, Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, um, thank thank uh, Kelly Mullen, who's the uh, outgoing president for the Lake Huron Fishing Club and uh, Kelly's done uh, just a fabulous job with with, uh, with the Lake Huron Fishing Club and of course they've run a great derby over over, the, over time and I want to th congratulate uh, Councillor Dave Mayotte. I, I think I've got it right Dave. I think you're the incoming president for the uh, Lake Huron Fishing Club and I just wanted to congratulate you on your new appointment. All right. Thanks for all the great work you do Dave with, uh, with the fish hatchery too. Thank you. Councilor Schreider. Uh, thank you. Um, last Saturday, I think I attended one of my favorite events so far this year. Um, so Sogging Shore's number one fan by Cottrell, which everybody knows, and she probably knows your name as well. She has not been able to watch baseball or hockey since the beginning of COVID. So a couple of local families organized and planned uh, a road hockey game in front of her apartment. Uh, she was brought out with her family uh, and a couple of friends. Um, and this is just one more example of how this community rallies, uh, extends love and demonstrates responsibility. It was a COVID safety event um, with measures put in place. Uh, it made Vi smile, it made the kids smile and even us adults that were there, even though you couldn't see our smile because of our masks, but uh, it was a great, great day. Uh, Vi turns 85 next month, um, and I remember attending her 80th birthday at the United Church, and I know that, that this year will be a, a lot different of a celebration for her, but, um, you know, it, it, it was a great afternoon, and there was signs and, and a hockey game and cars honking for her, a car rally and that, so, um, you know, just congratulations to Vi and those that put on the event and that this community loves her and wishes her well, and we'll see her back in the arena soon. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Smith. Thank you. Uh, as we approach the holiday season, we are now, last check, I think we're 51 days from Christmas. Uh, I just wanted to put out a reminder to folks that the Port Elgin Shoppers Night will be occurring. And in fact, uh, in, in light of COVID, we're going uh, beyond a one night event and on to a three night event. So uh, the Port Elgin Shoppers Night will occur on November 26th, 27th, and November 28th. So mark that in your calendar if you're Considering starting your shopping early, uh, hold on to the opportunity to uh, shop local as much as possible. Thank you, Councillor Rich. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, over the past week, I've had an opportunity to give out uh, Soggy Shores uh, Business Awards um, uh, with Heather Hyde. Um, we went to Dizzy Bird, Lac Boutique, Blackbird. Um, went to the Olive Oil Company today and to Duffy's Fish and Chip Shop. Um, so all of the business owners have been nominated and uh, great little write-ups by uh, some of their patrons. Uh, it's a great um, 
you know, uplifting thing. Um, they're all doing such a, such a great job in, uh, out in Southampton. Um, and as well, wear a poppy, um, show some respect for um, those who have um, put their life on the line for, for us and our way of life. I, I think it's uh, one of the most important things we can do each year. Have a great day. Thank you, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to remind everyone about the um, upcoming fundraiser that's sponsored by the Southampton Rotary Club and the uh, Marine Heritage Society. Um, it's to benefit the um, uh, the light, the harbor, the uh, range light at the Southampton Harbor. Um, they're fundraising to try to uh, subsidize and pay for the repair of that. Um, and so what they're doing is doing a virtual um, concert and uh, jazz for the light is what it's called. I think they have a silent auction that's going on. And at the same time, uh, they, there will be local restaurants who are participating. So uh, you can go on and buy tickets and you can also support our local restaurants uh, by ordering in that night, hopefully. Uh, some of them have theme dinners uh, to support the event. Um, so that's on um, this Friday, November 13th. I think it starts at seven. If you want to go on to the Southampton Rotary Facebook page or website, uh, you can see how you could uh, donate or buy tickets. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carr. Thank you. And uh, I guess uh, I'm pretty sure Cheryl had brought this up before. Um, I said on the Heritage Committee, but I just wanted to bring back with Remembrance Day being this week, a reminder uh, between Sogging Times with Sandy Lindsay and uh, Bill Streeter that they're uh, doing some history behind our locals that have served for us with all the memorial uh, banners that are being, that are put up on the light standards through the main town in Port Elgin, Southampton there. Uh, I, I definitely encourage people to tune in and I know myself, I find it very interesting to learn about the people that serve for our freedom over the years and uh, how they tie into our community. So I encourage anybody that takes some interest in that to, to log on to Sogging Times and, and have a look at that series that, that Bill's put a ton of time and effort into that, uh, you know, I, I can't give enough kudos to, to something like that. It's something I truly respect and I hope that everybody steps up and, and honors Remembrance Day this year in, in our own special way in these uh, different times. Um, and then also too, just to kind of piggyback with Jamie and uh, the three nights of uh, Shoppers Night downtown this year. I know uh, the BIA is going out over and above this year at the Parquet. Uh, we're hoping to step up the game downtown, I think there, and uh, have something to be proud of this year in the center of town. I think after a year that we've had, we need something that the, the town can be proud of when we go through. Uh, from what I understand, that might be a virtual lighting this year. So hopefully people can tune in to see that, but hopefully we can look for some really nice things to come downtown to this season. Thank you, Councillor Mayat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I wasn't going to bring up the fishing club uh, presidency, but thank you very much for that recognition, Vice Deputy Mayor Mayat. Um, what I was going to bring up was a couple of developments that probably you've all heard about, and, and it was in the news media, and that was uh, some developments with the Police Services Board. And as the chair of the Police Services Board, I was uh, honored to uh, make two milestones last week. One was the signing of a memorandum of agreement with the Police Association, uh, which was the ratification of a four-year collective agreement. That'll bring us through till uh, December 31st, 2023. So that's, uh, that's going to uh, leave us of a lot of uh, burden for the next few years. And the second one was to hire a new chief. Um, uh, Vice or uh, Deputy Chief Zettel is now Chief Zettel. And uh, we were very pleased that we were able to convince him that, uh, that we needed him and that he was the right man for the job. And he was unanimously uh, appointed by the board to be the new chief. And uh, we are all very confident and very happy and, and we're sure that he will do a great job for the town of Sogging Shores. Uh, one other thing that I was reminded of is the Port Elgin Rotary Club is having an auction sale on November the 22nd, which is uh, it'll be the weekend before our next council meeting. So if you're uh, so inclined, look up uh, Port Elgin Rotary on the, online and they are gonna have a virtual event uh, so that they can continue to do the great things they do in our community. Thank you. And remember- I uh, just wanted to, uh, uh, well, first just uh, congratulations to you and the board on the, completing the contract and, uh, and congratulations to Chief Zettel and uh, 
looking forward to uh, participating in the formal swearing-in ceremony for him, uh, I guess, next week with you, Dave. So uh, that's uh, so that's very positive news, and he's going to make an excellent chief. Um, one thing, uh, I have one thing, it relates to what Councillor Carr and Councillor Smith were talking about. That's Christmas tree lightings. And uh, one thing, I have uh, I have many skills, but one of them is not lighting Christmas trees. I'm really bad at it and uh, need as much help as I can get. Uh, and so uh, I'm hoping that we can get a couple of young people uh, to join me uh, in uh, filming virtual Christmas tree lightings in uh, downtown Port Elgin and downtown Southampton. Uh, we're accepting uh, entries from uh, across the community, looking for uh, uh, kids to tell me what they love about the holiday season here in Sogging Shores. And uh, just 150 words or less, uh, before the 12th, uh, so just this week, we need to get those entries in quick, but um, very excited to uh, find a couple of good entries and uh, get some desperately needed help lighting those Christmas trees uh, downtown and kicking off the holiday season uh, later this month. So with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Rich, all in favor. We stand adjourned, we'll reconvene at uh, five to nine. They will call to order this regular council meeting. Uh, the second item on the agenda is disclosure of pecuniary interest. Does anyone have one of those they wish to declare at this time? Seeing none, of course, you can do that any time if you need to. Item three is additions, deletions, amendments to the agenda. We do have one suggested uh, amendment to the agenda, uh, and I have a resolution that uh, the council agenda be amended to add item 8.2, notice of motion regarding a donation to the local Royal Canadian Legions. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Carr. All in favor? That's carried. All right, that then moves us on to, uh, we have no public meeting, so it moves on to adoption of minutes. And we have the regular council minutes of October 26, 2020, and the Committee of the Whole minutes of October 26, 2020. And I have a resolution that council adopt the minutes of the council meeting of October 26, 2020, and note and file the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting of October 26, 2020, as presented. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Grace, seconded by Rich. Questions or comments to either of those sets of minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? It's carried. That then moves us on to reports of the Committee of the Whole. And the first one is a general government report regarding sidewalk, patio, and cafe policy extension. The resolution that Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores adopts the general government report dated October 26, 2020, recommending that the revisions to the sidewalk, patio, and sidewalk, cafe, encroachment policy be extended to October 31, 2021. 1, October 31, 2021. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Schreider, seconded by Smith. Questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor. That is carried. That then moves on to the second report, an infrastructure and development report regarding Class EA landfill expansion. I have a resolution that Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores adopts the infrastructure and development report dated October 26, 2020, recommending the sole sourcing of GM Blue Plan to proceed with the environment assessment for the landfill expansion as recommended in the Waste Management Master Plan with funding through the 2021 budget and landfill expansion reserve. This is a remover and second. Moved by Grace, seconded by Carr. Questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? As carried. All right, that moves us then on to reports of municipal officers. And we have one report, Bruce Road 25 Storm Outlet Committee report. I'll read, I'll read the resolution. We can get a mover and seconder, and then we'll ask if there's any comments from the director. Uh, the resolution is that council accepts recommend, recommendation number one outlined in the Bruce Road 25 Outlet Committee report dated November 9th, 2020, and that recommendation number two be referred to the striking committee. Is there uh, questions or, or, pardon me, is there a mover and seconder to the recommendation? Moved by Carr, seconded by Matheson. Uh, so questions or comments to the resolution? I will say that, uh, um, the resolution reads that was my suggestion that uh, the recommendation from uh, the committee to uh, for to extend its mandate be referred to striking. Obviously, we have a we have a mandate for the committee that that uh, its work really ends with its report. So if it's if it's to be extended, um, striking will need to come back with a new 
mandate for the committee with some new uh, with a new timeline, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the best approach is to is to refer that uh, portion of the recommendation from the committee to striking for consideration and they can, and then striking will report back. So that's the reason for the reference to striking. Um, Amanda, did you have any comments that you'd like to make uh, prior to council considering the resolution? Uh, thank you and through you. My only comment is if uh, a council wishes that final detail about how the outlet works to, um, to prevent standing water uh, is not shown on the sketches, but is, is fine by staff to incorporate into the design. Okay. Are there questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. All right, then that moves us on to motions and notices of motion. We have one notice of motion, which is for support of local media, and that will be considered at our next regular council meeting. And we have the other, uh, which is the addition, notice of motion, donation to Royal Canadian Legions. There is a resolution, uh, pardon me, yes, a resolution uh, moved by, already moved by Councillor, pardon me, moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Rich, that the procedural rules be suspended to waive the notice, notice of this motion to allow debate to occur at the November 9th, 2020 Council meeting in advance of Remembrance Day. That is moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. So I will read the resolution. It has been moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by Councillor Rich, that whereas council has previously agreed to contribute $5,000 to the Rotary International Symposium that was to be held in Soggy and Shores in the summer of 2020, and whereas the global COVID-19 pandemic forced the Rotary International Symposium that was to be held in Soggy and Shores to be canceled, and, the, and that the Southampton Rotary Club returned the donation to the municipality, and whereas council received this donation back and approved that it be designated to another worthy organization. Now, therefore, be it resolved that council authorize a donation of $2,500 to the Southampton Legion Branch 155 and a donation of $2,500 to the Port Elgin Legion Branch 340 for their poppy fund campaigns and that the donations be funded from the corporate donation budget. Uh, it's already been moved and seconded. Is there questions or comments to the resolution? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to let council know that there is a difference between donating to the local Legion and to the poppy fund. The Poppy Fund is, is part of the Legion that, that raises money for other, other groups. So because of COVID, the local Legions have not been able to get out and, and do their Poppy uh, fundraising as they normally would. Therefore, their, their uh, donations and the way they help other organizations is, is strapped this year. So I felt that it would be a, a good way to, to help out a very worthwhile cause that's not the Legion, but many other, any other uh, groups throughout the community. Uh, such as the hospital for one. So I think this is a great thing and, and I thank council for supporting it. Are there any other questions or comments to the resolution? I appreciate you bringing the resolution, uh, Deputy Mayor. And uh, we have a unique situation here with this $5,000 that uh, we had allocated to Rotary and looking for another worthy cause. Uh, and uh, certainly the Poppy Fund and local or local Rotary, pardon me, our local legions are a worthy cause. and. Uh, and what time better than now to make a donation uh, to them. So if there's nothing further, I'll ask all in favor. That's correct. Okay, then that moves us on to bylaws. Uh, and uh, there are uh, three bylaws there to consider. Does anyone wish to have any of them drawn out for individual consideration? Seeing no call for that, I'll read the resolution that the following bylaws are hereby read a first, second, and third time and finally passed and sealed this 9th day of November, 2020. One, 73, 2020, being a bylaw to authorize the entering into of a subdivision agreement with White Gold Limited for the development of phase two of the Madwash subdivision. Two, 74, 2020, being a bylaw to establish 0 0.3 meter reserves on plan 3M235 and plan 3M234 as part of public highways. And three, 75, 2020, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meeting of the Corporation of the Town of Soggy and Shores. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Grace, seconded by Carr. Questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? As carried. 
Uh, and so that moves on to the final resolution being the one to adjourn. And I have a resolution that this regular council meeting of November 9, 2020, hereby adjourns at 9.04 p.m. Mover and seconder, please. Moved by Carr, seconded by Rich. All in favor, we stand adjourned.